Hi, Shuba. Shuba. You are the superstar of the workshop today. <laughs> yeah, that's why I came to see Shuba. Yeah, we are here for you, Shuba. Yeah. And <laughs> you're in red. You're shiny. You are. You're muted, muted Shuba. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm getting ready for Christmas. I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you Fang, do you? Can you tell me who is the timer? Oh, uh, I'm the timer. Yep, the timer. And uh, yeah, you can see different: the green, the yellow, the red. Okay. So uh, the agenda would be first. Um, I have two volunteer speakers. Yes. E Fang and Hema. Yes. Uh, they should be joining shortly. So they will be giving a speech before I give my presentation. So I, first I'll just give a brief introduction for like a couple of minutes. Then they will be giving speeches. I think their speeches you don't need to time because it's a, it's a specific, it, I know exactly what the time would be. So it's okay. Um, okay, okay. If that works better for you, yes. Yes, I think that's fine. Okay. Uh, because they are going to uh, do a storytelling, which is exactly a limited set of words. They're going to read out the exact one. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, my presentation, I'm hoping it should be 15 minutes. I might go a little bit more, maybe 17, depending on how much I enact. Okay, and so for your 15 minute, uh, ideally 15 minute presentation, I will show green at 12 or 13. I, I, I want the green at 10. Okay, 10 then. Then uh, yellow at 13 and okay. then red at 15. Okay, get it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Yeah. And after that, again, they will give the same speech, what they spoke before with all the tips uh, that they're going to gain wow. so that you can see the difference. And then I'm hoping that we at least like a 15 minute stable topic session type of thing, which is again, storytelling. Um, and so I will, uh, it's like an impromptu storytelling. Okay, I get it. And uh, we will choose members from the audience. Uh -huh. and they have to use body language and uh, tell the stories. And for that, Gavin, I want to do time one to two minutes, like a regular table. Okay, talk. okay, I get it. Okay, I get it. Uh, for the speech, the sample speeches by Eva Hema. Yeah, six they minutes. Both, yeah. Yeah, they are here. Six minutes. Maybe roughly six minutes, I would assume mm -hmm. each three minutes each. So should I okay, put the agenda it. in the chat? Sure. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I think I. Um... Okay. Perfect. Yeah. That's the idea. So hi, Shubhat. I'm the Toastmaster today. Oh, Is it Ichung? Uh, yeah, I will introduce you at the beginning. Okay. Thank you. It will be a fun workshop. Yeah. Can, I, uh, any, can you enable screen sharing so I can share my slides? Okay, sure. Shoba, the co host. Here you go. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I see Michael. Michael, haven't seen you in Toastmaster for a long time. Hi. Hi, mm -hmm. Michael. Hello. I haven't met you before here, uh, here I believe. OK, I used to uh, be in Toastmasters. I, uh, I served on a number of different uh, leadership roles there and within the group. And uh, I, uh, I stopped after I got too busy at work. <laughs> OK, yeah. Yeah, man, many people have the similar experience. Yeah, yeah. but I, I learned a lot and uh, it's helped me a great deal. And so uh, I went through, I forget the name of the, uh, of the first level, the first 10 things. CCC. Communication. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I went through that. Okay, okay, thank you. So Yichun, please be prepared, get yourself ready to start the meeting, maybe for... 30 more seconds. Yeah, let's start on time. Toastmaster start on time. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, and uh, all the members, if you can put, uh, 
your Zoom in side-by-side uh, -side mode so that you have screen sharing and you can see me also on the side. How do we do that? So you click on the right upper part, there is a view. You click on the side-by-side -side gallery view. So put it side-by-side -side speaker view. Oh, side-by-side yeah. -side speaker. Yes, side-by-side -side speaker, yes. Okay, Shuba, you may stop the sharing because the Toastmaster will open the meeting. Okay, fine. Let me stop. Okay, thank you. Toastmaster. Yeah, uh, let me change my name as Toastmaster, then I will start to... Great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Let's start our fun workshop today. And this is a ASML Silicon Valley monthly workshop. Today, our topic is a kinesis, the power of body language by our guest speaker, Shuba. Shuba has been in Toastmaster for nine years and she has held various leadership positions such as a club officer, area director and division director, and she had won various of international and humor speech in area and division level. Here, we would like to welcome Suba as our speaker to start our speech and workshop. Welcome, Suba. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks a lot. I'm glad to be here today. So let's start with the workshop. I'll start by sharing my screen first. As I said before, please have your uh, Zoom option in side-by-side -side mode. So you can see me on one side and you can see this shared slides on another side throughout and put it in side-by-side -side speaker mode. So I'm here to talk about kinesics. What is kinesics? It is the study of body movement and body language. In Toastmasters, we give a lot of prominence to content and voice modulation. But we need to give a lot more to body language as well. Want, you want to know why? The elements of communication, when you look at it, 7% is for your spoken content. 38% is because of voice modulation. And 55% is with body language. It's often known that the amount of likeness people have towards their physicians is just because how much they really like the mannerisms more than the competency of a particular physician. And they have done a survey on TED Talks which go viral. Most often the TED Talks which go viral are the ones which has the maximum amount of vocal modulation and body, long, body language. When we are interested in a speech, we decide within the first 10 seconds whether we are interested in the speech, in the opening, depending on the voice modulation and the body language. So much so that 70% of politicians apparently win their seat within the first five to 10 seconds when they start speaking. None of us like Obama for his um, uh, always, right? We know for an accountant how crazy that can be, but Obama with his charm and with his body language, with his confidence, just jumped from a senator to a president overnight. And it was poetic the way he won the, uh, the election that night. So this is, this is the most important criteria in kinesics is body language. So for me to before going proceeding with the workshop, I want to do a few things. I have a couple of volunteers today who will be 
storytelling, a particular story, both Yi Fang and Hema Raja, who are with me here today. And after I give my presentation, they will be giving the same speech again with an enhanced body language. Hopefully, they will learn something from my tips today. They will give. So without further ado, first, before I give my presentation, I want Ifang and Hema on stage to give their presentation. Ifang, please. Mute. It's on mute right now. Ifang, you are muted. Hello. Yes. OK, thank you. One day long ago in India, a hunter came to a big tree. The tree was so big that its branches turned back and went down right into the ground. From those very points, the baby tree would grow up. Have you ever seen such a thing? Trees that do that are called banyan trees. Ah, said the hunter when he saw that banyan tree. This is the right tree for me. Today, I'm going to catch a lot of birds. He threw his net over the tree. The strings of the net sank down in the tree. You couldn't see the net anymore. The clever hunter put grains of rice over the leaves. The grains of rice were easy to see, even from far away. Just then, White Wing, king of the dove, was flying overhead, with all his doves flying behind him. He saw the banyan tree. Wow, said the White King. This must be our lucky day. Look at all rice over the tree. The white king flew down to the tree. Other doves followed him to the tree. But oh no, as long as they landed on the tree, everyone was trapped by the net. Someone was glad to see this. Well, well, said the hunter. Look at all these doves. I will have a fine dinner. Seeing the hunter, the doves cried out, it's over for us. As soon as they landed, each one was trapped in the net. Wait, wait, said the white wing. There is a way for us to get free, but we must act together. What can we do? cried a duck. The hunter is almost here. Alone, none of us can lift this net, said the white wing. It's too big and heavy. We know, we know, cried the doves. But if we all fly up together at the same time, said the white wing, we can lift this net. We will fly it to the city, past these woods. I know a mouse who lives there. He's a dear friend. And I'm sure he will help us free us and ch by chewing through the net. If we all fly up together at the same time, said the white wing, we can lift this net. Look, the hunter, cried a duck. Everyone, yelled the white wing. Now, at once, all of the doves flew up. Together, they lifted the net right up out of the banyan tree. The hunter could not believe his eyes. All the birds he was going to have at dinner were flying up high in the sky and they were taking his net with him. White wing and the doves flew with the net over the woods and to the city. There, white wing found his friend, the mouse, and the mouse freed them one and all. Thank you, Yifang and Hema. So we, we heard the story 
of the hunter and the dogs and how the dog cheated the hunter. We will listen to the story again after I give my presentation. Now, what is nonverbal communication? There are different ways we can nonverbally communicate when we are giving a speech or just when we are talking to people. Certain important criteria by which we convey our meaning is by repetition. You do the same movement again and again. By the third time when you're doing the movement, people know that you are mentioning a particular content. For example, if you say, I, when giving a speech, you say, I went from here to there, and then I started running from here to here. But then the third time when you're doing this, people know you're in a hurry and you're running. It could be anywhere in your speech. That's what repetition gets you when you're non-verbally communicating. Contradiction is something you don't want to do. You don't want to do a body movement or any kind of gesture which is contradicting what you are saying. But there might be some times when you might want to add it for humor. You can say, I was very excited. My mom called me and I was very excited. You see, now it's a contradictory movement that you're doing a gesture, but it is conveying a message too. Substitution is sometimes you don't even want to say what you're saying. You can just say, huh. you shrug. It means I don't care. You're just substituting a gesture for what you want to say. Complimenting is when your boss comes in and he pats your back. So he's complimenting his message with a pat on your back. Accenting is just your movement and gesture helping overall whatever you want to convey. So these are some of the ways by which you can non-verbally communicate. Now let's think about the types of non-verbal communication that we have. Body movement, which we all know as Toastmasters, that you have to move around the stage. And posture, how you stand in stage is very, very critical for a speech or in general. Gestures, when I say gestures, I mean hand gestures, the way I'm doing right now. When I'm speaking, you can see I am moving my hands and I am moving my arms, my legs. So using these movements, you can do various gestures. Facial expressions. When Hema was delivering her speech, she was sitting and looking straight at the camera and delivering. Whereas Ifan was sitting, standing a little behind. Ifan had the facility to move her arms and legs as well, whereas Hema did not. So for her, facial expressions is key. Then number four, eye contact. We all know this has been drummed and drummed and drummed into our brains. We have to have eye contact. Number five is touch. The way you touch your face when you're giving presentation, like the way I'm doing right now, that also matters because it sends a message to the audience. Space. I'm not going to talk about space today. Today's talk is about kinesics. It's not about proxemics, which is what space is all about. Right now we are all familiar with social distancing, which is six feet. We all know that by now, there is no confusion. When it comes to space, you have intimate space, which is when you're talking to someone really close. So when we are giving a speech, we try to mention our spouse or somebody really close, we just stand, turn to this side and speak as though that person is right next to us. There is something called a personal distance, which is three feet apart. You stand here when you're talking to someone else one-on-one, -on -one, that person is maybe three feet from you. That's, in, it's not too intimate, but it's a personal distance. Then comes what we call social distance. Yes. It isn't it called social distance, which is six feet apart when you are 
trying to keep some distance away. This happens in general, even in a Toastmasters meeting, when the audience are at least six feet away from you. In a social environment, that's what you want to maintain. And then, of course, a public distance, which is when you're in public. And voice modulation, we all know about that as Toastmasters. So today, I'm not going to touch upon touch, space, and voice, because that's not part of our moment. I'm going to talk about postures, gestures, facial expressions, and eye contact. Postures. There are two important postures that you have to always look for. One is open posture. The other is closed posture. The way I'm standing right now, this is an open posture. This means you are relaxed. You have an open attitude. You know what you're saying. You're confident. And, you can, and whatever you say immediately carries to the audience. A closed posture generally shows, I'm really not for this. You know, I don't like what you're saying. This is what a closed posture tends, tends to give as a message. Uh, sometimes in an air conditioned room, women tend to keep this just because they are cold. In that case, it's different. But generally, when you keep this, that's not a good posture to have. And when you're doing online meetings, if you're sitting down, sit straight. That's the posture you want to have. If you're going for an interview, you want to be straight. Sit straight so that they think you are confident. You have to be confident, but perception is key. Sometimes perception is almost truth. That's what happens in the real world. So do not slouch and sit like this. Always sit straight and be open. Those are the two important key features and key postures that you have to keep in mind when you are delivering a speech or elsewhere when you have to when you have an important appointment. Here are some more posture examples for you. Hands on hips. What does this say? It tells people, I am intimidating. This also some, right? It tells I'm ready for a fight even, but it also tells I'm confident sometimes, depending on the context. But if you stand like this, which I showed just now, it means you're defensive, you're not ready to listen. Similar to that, hands in your pockets. If you look like this, it's you're too relaxed and you're too casual. Again, you're not ready to listen. This is not a confident attitude to have. Hands behind your back. I'm sure many of you would have seen elders or seniors and your bosses, sometimes they have their hands behind their backs when you're talking to them. That shows confidence and that shows superiority when you have hands behind your back. There are some more subtle movements on how you hold your hands behind your back, but we don't want to go in details into that because nobody's going to see behind what happens behind your back. The way you can use your postures. If you look at some of the examples I have down here, how do you say I'm tired? Right? This shows you're tired. So when you're giving a speech, you can actually substitute that you're tired. You're coming back and you say, oh, it was a long day. I had to commute so many miles and by the time I came home and you do this, people know you're tired when you're giving a speech. So, and I am sorry. The, the one that says I'm sorry, what we call as a fig leaf position, you hold like this. It's like, I'm really sorry about this. It, but again, there are some contexts where this again shows you are not confident enough. You are submissive. You're just listening to people. You, you are not feeling confident in being superior, right? So these are some of the ways your posture can affect the message you are sending. You, you have to be very, very careful about it, not just when you're giving a speech, even at work or anywhere else, because it's very important that we convey the right message when we are talking to our peers. 
So what we discussed so far is the posture that you're going to carry. Now let's move on to gestures. There are two types of gestures. One is called beat gestures. Beat gestures is what I'm doing right now. If you had noticed me all this while, you would have seen that every time when I give a point, I'm actually moving my hand like this. That's called beat gesture. That is something that comes on its own. You, don't, you are not really consciously doing it, but it is, it, it's involuntarily coming, but you're still making a point. It is actually good. For some people, it is very easy. It be gestures come automatically. But ensure that it doesn't become a mannerism where you start fidgeting. This type of beating is not good. Iconic gestures are one which are voluntarily giving. Thumbs up, thumbs down. This is an iconic gesture. Just be careful when you're talking to people across cultures because sometimes gestures can vary between cultures. For example, we make eye contact here in our culture, whereas in some Asian cultures, including where I come from, sometimes if you make eye contact, it's supposed to be rude. So in iconic, you have descriptive, you have emphatic, you have suggestive, prompting. Prompting is when you ask an audience, how many of you have listened to uh, Bob Dylan, let's say. When you do this, people know you're prompting them to lift their hand. These are called prompting gestures. Now, positive and negative gestures. There's not, when I say negative gestures, doesn't mean you should not use these gestures. All I'm saying is you should know where to use it effectively, depending on the message you want to convey. If your head is tilted to one side when you're talking to somebody, you're, you're, you're standing like this, you know you're listening to them keenly, you're observing them. Whereas at the same time, you're sitting like this, then you know that's a sign of boredom. If you're rubbing your hands together, and you say, oh, come on, let's do it. You know, that's anticipation, let's do it. You're all excited. But then you, if you do the same thing, you say, oh, come on, let's do it. You're fidgeting now. You know it's nervous. It's the exact same content that you have. I didn't even change the vocal modulation. Just the body language gives you a totally different message. But as I said, again, same thing. Standing straight, arms crossed over the chest. Those are positive and negative. And when you're talking, if you're leaning in like this, especially when you're doing online meetings, that means you're trusting. But at the same time, if you do something like this, that's boredom. With facial expressions, again, as I said, this goes back to what I said before about touch. If you're stroking your chin and thinking, that's being thoughtful. But at the same time, when you're, if you're pulling your ear, you're, this is not thinking. If you're doing like this, then the person thinks that you don't know what you're thinking. You're indecisive. indecisive. So you're just pulling your ears like this. So just the same content in different forms with, the, with your body language can convey a totally different message. Now think about, let's, these are positive and negative gestures. Now hand gestures. There can be symbolic hand gestures, which is again goes back to what I showed before with thumbs up and thumbs down. Emotional gestures, or when you said, when I said, I don't care, I am tired. These are conveying your emotions as to what you're feeling at that time. Prompting again, which I said with the hand gesture and then pointing. When you're pointing to something and you're talking about it, the next time when you just point it, you people know you're gesturing to point at that particular object. Putting verbs into action is something all Toastmasters do. When you watch any speeches, they always do it. They say, if, if I am hugging the baby, then, then you say, I'm hugging, right? That is putting verbs into action, which we all tend to do 
which Yi Fang also did when she was giving her speech initially. When she said flying, she did like this, right? So that, in, that is putting your verbs into action. These are different types of hand gestures that can get you get your message across. Facial expressions. Let's do it this way. Let's take one single sentence. Do you think you can do this? So if I were in shock, I'd say, I raise my eyebrows and I say, do you think you can do this? If it is with anger, do you think you can do this? Sad, do you think you can do this? Do you think you can do this? <laughs> do you think you can do this? You see the difference? With my just my facial expressions, it was exact same sentence, but with all, and, and the same vocal modulation. I did not change the vocal modulation too. But then I, you see all the difference here. You can carry a totally different message. Eye contact is key. Use the 50-70 rule. You uh, ensure that 50% of the time you make eye contact when you're speaking, 70% of the time you're making eye contact when you're listening. And you look at a particular member in the audience for four seconds. And then you move away slowly from them. And there's something called a Z formation, which I've not mentioned here. You start from one end of the room, go to the other end of the room, then come back to the front of the room and then go to this end. That's like a Z. That, is, that, that helps when you're making eye contact with the audience because it is not easy for everyone to make eye contact with the audience. Some basic do's and don'ts when you're doing speech delivery. Practice in front of a mirror. Practice, practice, practice with the body language. Create a gesture for all your main points. You say, I have three points. Point number one, and then do your gesture, whatever it's needed for that point. Do not overdo it. That is very important. Do not repeat, repeat it again and again too much. That is important. And your movements have to be deliberate. Just because you have to do body movement doesn't mean you keep on facing up and down, up and down the stage. It has to be deliberate. You should know why you are moving from one spot to another spot to convey a message. And as always, put verbs into action and have eye contact. I want to show you an example. It's very difficult to feel special. So God has shared my fellow flowers. I can remember the first time I grew up. I was 17 years old. I had already flunked high school and managed to get myself arrested. Now, I wasn't afraid of the cops, but there was one person I was very afraid of, and that was my mom. Raise your hand if you have an emotional mother. Let me see. Put them all together, you get mama. I can hear her scream outside the police station. Even the cops were afraid. She came up to me, held the iron bars, looked into my eyes, and I saw a tear coming down her face. Now I've seen my mama cry before, but mothers cry three types of tears. Tears of joy, tears of sorrow, and tears of shame. And when the sun sees. So, uh, before I go for the presentation, in the previous uh, video clip, you saw that he had literally all the gestures that I was talking about so far. In that one minute clip, you could see holding the iron bars, that is descriptive, tears of joy. Tears of shame. That is telling you, like that's using your body movement gestures, like saying one part and then the other part, right? The next time when he does this, people know he's going to come up with one more point. And tears flowing down her cheeks. And when he talks about that, that's again a descriptive one. And when he said, I'm not afraid of the cops, you saw the movement? That's exactly what we want to show, that he's really not afraid. And then when he said even the cops are afraid of his mama, he stood like this. That conveys a lot of message in that one minute clip. 
that's where you have to be. That's what you need. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. This, I, I, it, the slides I will show later. This, I spoke about presentation gestures. When you are given, uh, giving an official presentation, what to do and what not to do and what it conveys at work, especially. But moving on, right now we are in the online world. So you don't have the luxury of moving around the stage, doing all those postures and body movements. So what are the few things that you can look for when you're giving an online speech, a virtual speech? Just make sure you dress appropriately and then sit straight in front of the laptop. If possible, come behind and stand. If you have enough space and you have the right lighting to do all that. And ensure your hands are visible on camera. Often we tend to sit like this. Sometimes your hands are too close to the camera. You don't want that. You should ensure your proportions are right and your hands are visible. Look directly at the camera. If you want to have any notes at all, make sure you have the notes right next to your uh, Zoom uh, account so that you can, Zoom window, so that you can, it looks like you're looking at the camera. And smile. You are really close to the camera compared to a stage that we usually have. Ensure smile. Get close, not too close. That's what I just said. I want to leave you with an example from the 2020 world champion, which was all virtual. So here is one more clip for you. Technology challenged in my school. And as I watched that film, all of a sudden something started looking strange. The film slowed down. And when it picked back up, it made a sound like it looked like it was blinking. Then the sheriff was talking to us from the side of the screen. The blinking started again with a loud noise. Everything went blank. I ran to the front and I turned off the projector. I opened it up. Something smelled like it was burning. Okay. So if you look at this online speech, the most important uh, body movement or gesture is your facial expression here. If you see when he said something smelled awful, that's his facial expression. That is very, very critical. In, uh, in an online meeting, it's all about your facial expression. You can convey a lot of meaning with your facial expressions. And the way he used the camera angle and when he moved, he peeped in for the sheriff to move. So those are the things that you have to look, look out for when you are doing an online speech. If you really look at his, he was the world champion. He went back and forth. But in this one minute clip, you could see only from here. You are not even seeing his all the way up to his waist. It's only from here. But he conveyed whatever he wanted just from here. Use your hands, use your face. That's what you need for an online speech. Thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. We'll go for question and answer session uh, later. But now I want to see what Ifang and Hema can do with their speeches using what we discussed just now. Especially Ifang will be standing so she can use a little bit more body movement. Hema will be sitting and giving a speech. So let's start with Ifan. One day long ago in India, a hunter came to a tree. That tree was so big. Its branches turned back down and went back to the ground. From those very spots, the baby tree would grow up. Have you ever seen such a thing? Trees that do that are called banyan trees. Ah, said the hunter when he saw that tree. 
This is just right for the net. I will catch a lot of birds today. He threw his net over the trees. The strings of the net sank down in the branches. You could not see the net anymore. The clever hunter puts grains of rice all over the leaves. The leaves and the rice were easy to see, even from far away. Just then, White Wing, king of the doves, flying over with all his doves behind him. He saw that banyan tree down there. Wow, said White Wing, this must be our lucky day. See all the rice below. He flew down, all the doves followed him to the tree. But oh no, as soon as all of them landed on the tree, each one was trapped by the net. Someone is glad to see this. Well, well, said the hunter. Look at all these doves. I will have a fine dinner. Seeing the hunter, all doves cried out, it's over. Uh, hey, mom, before you go, uh, let me just give up. A short evaluation for Yifang. So Yifang, you, you did all that well. So a few more things to consider would be, ha, huh, said the hunter, right? Ha, huh. just say like this, right? So the, the hunter is looking at the uh, banyan tree and thinking, so ha, huh, said the hunter, maybe I can do this. And when you talk, you, you did use body movements effectively when you spoke about white wing and the dog coming in. Then you say, right wing was thinking and said, ah, that looks like a nice location. So because of the, they're flying high, they're looking down, right? So when you're conveying those messages, imagine the scenario and use it effectively, especially when you're storytelling, you can almost enact the whole story. So when, you are, when, when the doves are looking, they're looking at uh, down there and the hunter is happy when he sees them coming too, right? So have all those emotions and especially your expressions. I think your facial expressions can be even more. Because now the hunter is happy, the doves are happy when they're looking at it. So they are like excited. You did have vocal modulation. You did that very well. Just add more excitement wherever it's in. Add a little bit more drama to it. <laughs> wow, look at the rice. Exactly, <laughs> right? So the moment you do that, um, then it becomes even more effective. It, it just keeps the audience engaged. That's mm -hmm. the idea. Thank you, Yifan. Thank you. Okay, hey, Ma. As soon as they landed, each one was trapped in the net. Wait, wait said the white wing. There is a way for us to get free, but we must all act together. What can we do? cried a dove. The uh, hunter is almost here. Alone, none of us can lift this net, said the white wing. It is too big and heavy. We know, we know, cried the doves. But if we all fly together at the same time, said the white wing, we can lift this net. We will fly to the city, past these woods. I know a mouse who, can, who lives there. He is a dear friend of mine, and I'm sure he will help us free by chewing through the net. If we all fly up together at the same time, said the white wing, we can lift this net. Look, the hunter, cried a dog. Everyone, yelled White Wing, now! At once, all the doves flew up. Together, they lifted the net right up off the banyan tree. The hunter could not believe his eyes. All the birds he was going to have at dinner were flying up high in the sky. And they were taking his net with them. White Wing and the doves flew with the net over the woods and to the city. There, White Wing found his friend, the mouse, and the mouse freed them one and 
all. Thank you, Hema. See, you did, uh, Hema, I think you were spot on. Uh, I mean, only thing is you need to look at the camera more. I, I suppose you had your notes on the side. That is okay. That's, that is not a problem. You used your hands very effectively when you said uh, that they all lifted the net and the hunter looked. That's exactly what we need to do. There's one thing, again, I spoke about beat gestures, the way I'm doing right now, when we make a point. So throughout your speech, you were you were making a point with your hand when, throughout your speech. Just be a little bit careful about that. See, beat gestures are good, but when we are telling a story, we just don't want that gesture to over, overpower it a little bit, right? And your vocal variety actually improved a lot more compared to before. In the very first speech, the compared to that, this one now just because when you are when you are enacting, you are already in the mood, so you actually have more essence and more vocal modulation when we are giving a speech also. But with sitting down and telling the story, you did a tremendous job, and I want to commend both Efang and Hema for uh, going through uh, taking care, uh, ensuring that you have noted down all the tips and then using the gestures to convey your story. Thank you both. I have a comment to make. Uh, the first time when I gave my speech, I had my hand like in the uh. position and I just wanted to show the contrast. So I, yes. I wanted to, I just kept my hand together. So when you free your hands, automatically your voice also kind of frees up and then you can raise it and you can model it and you can control it. So yes. you become more confident. Perfect. Thank you, Hema. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I do have time for question and answer. But before that, I thought maybe just because it's a workshop. So I would like to have some volunteers from the audience. So I want to have a short table topic session. Gavin can time one to two minutes. This will also be storytelling because storytelling is always easier when you can enact the way you're speaking. It's an impromptu storytelling. I can start with, uh, anybody can start actually. Can I just pick people from uh, this chat window? I think that's okay. Is everyone uh, fine with uh, giving a table topic speech? Okay. I see Janice nodding her head really vigorously. So I'm going to start from Janice. Okay. Uh, so whenever you're speaking, unmute yourself and start speaking. Let me just give you one line. I, you can start from there. Okay. It was a dark night. It was dark and starry. starry. I was in San Francisco and I was walking down the road when suddenly I heard a noise. To you, on to you, Janice. It was a very dark and spooky night. And remind you, when I was walking through San Francisco, it is always foggy. And at that evening, I was walking through Golden Gate Park. Now you're probably asking me, why would I be walking through Golden Gate Park? Well, it's because somebody said on Halloween night, if you walk to a certain statue, you will see Edgar Allan Poe step off the pedestal and talk to you. Now I'm a fan of the poet and the horror story author, Edgar Allan Poe. And I really wanted to see that. So there I am walking by myself, which is not a good idea, walking by myself down a very cold and very foggy evening. I thought I heard something because now my job, I'm wearing tennis shoes, so I shouldn't be hearing anything. But yet behind me, I heard squishy sounds. And when I stopped, that sound stopped too. 
And I started walking again. And sure enough, the squeaky song kept on following me. I got a little scared because I wasn't sure what was coming by. I turned around. There was nobody there. And yet, I just got a feeling there was somebody following me. I don't know about this. Now, walking through Golden Gate Park by yourself at midnight, not a broke thing. Madam Table Topping Master. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Lorraine, why don't you continue? Please unmute yourself. Continue where Janet was left yes. off? Yes. All right, and Halloween. You think it's gonna be a scary night? And indeed it was, because those squishy sounds was somebody stalking me. I started walking faster and that person followed me and walked faster as well. I go, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I don't have my, any weapons on me to protect myself. And then he got closer and closer, and ah! he jumped on me. I tried to fight him off, and I was able to, and then I ran as fast as I could through Golden Gate Park, screaming, ah, help me! And I made it to the street, and Tony lives by Golden Gate Park. I know exactly where he lives. I ran to his house and rang the doorbell, Tony! Tony, please wait, open up the door, it's Lorraine. Somebody's after me. And he quickly opened the door and I ran up to him and I said, oh my God, somebody tried to attack me. I was so relieved that I was within his home and safe from that intruder. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Lorraine. That was good. That was a very good, uh, it had a very good flow to the story from Janice. Let me just go on uh, next. I think um, there is someone called, uh, I'm just going by the, if you're interested, please switch on your video so I know uh, you're interested and I can just call upon you. Arnie? You want to take next? Uh, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Can I do a lot of gestures because my, my chair is, doesn't make me, give me that mobility. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, can you uh, continue where Lorraine left? She was back at home. Somebody had jumped up on her, but she's now safe and sound at home. So you can you're, assume you're safe and sound at home. Continue the story. So I was home. And I decided not to go out again, and especially at Golden Gate Park, because, because there are so many characters in there, especially when it's dusk, when it's evening, when the middle, in the middle of the night, there's so many things, many characters there that bothers and creates some images in my mind. One time I was walking there at Lincoln Park, Lincoln Street, and I, I saw as if a dog was there with three heads. And I thought to myself, where, where did this come from? And then suddenly, I recall what Stephen King said that dogs could become snakes. And while I was trying to accelerate my speed, I could imagine the dog became a snake. And my God, I said to myself, this is not a real world. But then I ran as fast as I could and I met a lady and she said, where are you running, sir? And I told her, I could not open my, my mouth. I, I, I just could not do anything. What I did is run as fast as I could until I get to St. Mary's Hospital. And then from there, I just yelled, please help, help, help. Somebody is running after me. It's a witch or a snake or a dog or somebody else, a person with sharp teeth and bloody mouth. This is not Halloween anymore. This is just the real world of Stephen King. Oh, I went home 
And then I went directly to my library and took all the books of Stephen King and threw them away. Oh my God. I said, this is the one that excited my mind into a fantasy that scared me to death. So from now on, I just don't do anything. Don't go to Golden Gate Park. Don't read Stephen King's books. And then I just found out it was a dream. A dream that almost came true. My topic master. Thank you. That was good, Ernie. Um, so I guess uh, it's 5.50, we can go for one more person. So it was all a dream. And, uh, but still, you need to continue the story. I can, uh, I would like to call upon uh, you, Fang. You want to try it? Just tie up the story and end it. It was a dream. But I know that's a dream. I started to study dreams and why some dreams seem so realistic. And sometimes I find out if the dream is so realistic, it's most likely to be the opposite. So after some time studying about the dreams, I filled up my strengths and I decided I can go out there and walk in the dark again. So it's Halloween night again. I'm, I'm by myself walking in the San Francisco Golden Gate Park alone toward the statue. I want to look at the Ellen Poe's spirit coming out. Maybe he will read some nice poems to me. And I walk there. I'm on my tennis shoes. I shouldn't be making some sound, any sound, but there is that squeaky sound coming after me again. Back to you, Table Topic Master. Thank you, Yufan. So now we had four people speaking. We had Janice, followed by Lorraine, followed by Arnie, and then you, Fang. Janice, you had a very good beginning, and I could see that you were using your hands. If I were to give any uh, improvement or suggestion with regards to just body language, would be have more facial expressions, just show a lot more. That will, since, since I could see only from here, just try to have more expressions. Otherwise, you did great. And the ent your enthusiasm, enthusiasm really showed. And the second person was Lorraine. Lorraine, we all know Lorraine generally is a hyperactive person. That's one of the reasons why I called upon Lorraine. So she literally moved everywhere and she showed all the movements that you needed for uh, Toastmaster's speech. That was an excellent uh, job, Lorraine. Uh, and I think for you, I don't have that many improvements because I think you did capture it well. Uh, then uh, Arnie, when he spoke, his was a perfect example of how to use facial expressions a lot. Because you could see only from here. And he tried to use his hands a little bit, but his whole message was conveyed using his face. Whether he was shocked, he was in a dream, and then he's relaxed, oh, it's only a dream, don't listen to Steve, don't read Stephen King books. Everything was conveyed with just movements of his eyes, his nose, and his mouth. It was just facial expressions. And you, you had me engaged. It was gripping just with your facial expressions. That was a very commendable job, actually. The, the fact that it couldn't be, your hands could not be even seen properly, but you conveyed the message. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Yeah, the you, Fang, I actually have to uh, commend you for ending the story so well, because Arnie, when he ended, it almost felt like he ended the story saying it's all a dream. So I wanted to see what you will, uh, how you will continue 
with the story but you did manage it very well by saying that finally you took a walk into golden gate park just after the dream that was very well done but with regards to body language i think you can use a little bit more it almost felt like you suddenly remembered oh i have to show my hands you were sitting initially <laughs> we couldn't see your hands and then your hands kind of popped up and you started moving it a bit so have a little just be open be open and if possible stand i think when you stand you tend to be uh, more open with your body gestures so try to stand if possible if you think sitting is making you feel uncomfortable and you're not able to do it right and sometimes having a background a background uh, in our zoom inhibits us from using our hand motions so that is one more thing to consider because all the others they don't they didn't have a background uh, in zoom so when you move your hands it's easily visible and for some of us it's a problem because your hand just gets lost it's a real stephen king movie when you are when you have the background in zoom where things get lost everywhere so try to work on that but all in all it was great so thank you all the four of you for helping me with the table topic session now if you have any question and answers i guess uh, we can uh, have some discussion i have a question there ms rao let me start it during the world champion speech contest the toastmaster asked each of the five, the, the, top, the the champion the two runners up and she asked them what is more important to you is it the storytelling or performance point number 1 point number 2 Lacroix, the world champion, some time ago said, was asked the question: "Is speaking theatric theatrical?" And she said, "No, it's not. Uh, there's a, a a room for theater and there's a room for speaking." And then number three: How do you get rid of those involuntary gestures? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the. Uh, for the tidbits that you shared just now and this is something that i have seen also sometimes when we give a toastmaster speech we tend to be more theatrical i have seen people saying i went from here to there right when you tend to do that that's actually not appealing that's a little bit too much over the head when we do such things and it varies from uh culture to culture from what i have seen in us we tend to have more drama and more theater in toastmaster speech in uk it is lesser it depending on certain locations some speech uh, it, it, the the speech telling itself the way we use the gestures vary but you are right involuntary gestures is something that we have to curtail In fact, this just this morning, I I have a friend. Maybe she, I'm not sure if she at, is attending now. She has a problem with rocking. That's an involuntary gesture. Similar to mine, my involuntary gesture is the way. If you had seen me speak throughout today, my hands are always in the front. It just keeps moving up and down when I'm making points. People always say I dance in front of the camera. They, I don't even know dancing, but that's what I do all the time. So for that. it goes back to the basics practice 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 we have to stand in front of the mirror ensure there are no involuntary movements that we are doing i personally did that when i was uh, going for an area contest at the and then division and then on to district level by the time i was giving my district level contest speech i had only limited body movements just to what was required to move from one point to another ensuring that the, my hands don't keep on moving i i ensure that okay i keep it down i bring it up only when i need to when you are doing so i think the most important criteria there is practice 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 thank you so much thank, thank you so much you. yeah anyone else okay i think it's a uh, good that He Fang seemed to have memorized the story, and it would have been nice if Helma did the same, or at least put the notes 
right by the camera or in front because I could see her eyes going back and forth. It was a little bit distracting. Yes, yes. That I mean, that's a given. I think I gave the story to them just a couple of days back. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know. And that's one of the reasons why I was okay when Hema did that because I said, okay, fine. If you don't have time, just, just ensure that you look at it. True, I agree. Yeah, for uh, for giving a speech when we are using notes, have it right in front of your camera and look at the camera. Thank you, Lorraine. Okay, uh, it's uh, six p.m. I hope I'm hoping we are right on the dot. If anyone else have, uh, unless no one else has any questions, I'll hand it back to the Toastmaster, I guess. Thank you so much for Shabat. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Michelle. Okay, thank you. It's an impressive, engaging workshop. I really love the place that you said uh, before and after examples. That gave us a big change before your presentation and after it. And this also gives us, I learned three things from your workshop. First is do it. Second is observe others. <laughs> That's also important. And the third thing is we have uh, so many creative guest speakers and members. Thank you, everyone. And this is from our ASML Silicon Valley Toastmasters. We are open for new members to join. And also our uh, club time is uh, Saturday 5 to 6.30. And thank you again for the Shaba and Yifang and also Hafma and also all our table topic speakers. Thank you. And that's conclude our workshop today. Have a great weekend. Thank you, uh, thank Ipo, you so and thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to deliver this workshop to you all. And if you have any other further questions also, please feel free to email me. Uh, Yufan has my email ID, she can share it with everyone. And if you want any kind of uh, training one-on-one, -on -one, if you're giving a speech, you want to enhance it further, please feel free to email me. Feel free to come back. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, everyone. one thing here I want to mention is Shuba probably has trained this year's humor speech champion, Declan, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right. I, yeah, I did work with him a little bit. True. That's a really impressive. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Gavin. Thanks for having me. If you haven't leave your email, uh, sign our guest book, please do so. And we will send you the recording and also for uh, future workshop information. Thank you Indeed. for attending the ASML SWE uh, event. And the uh, ASML uh, SWE club members, Please stay for some longer time so we will discuss a club business. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, by the way, one more thing before you leave. Next workshop at ASML, we are invite Declan. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> the humorous speech champion this year at District 101 to walk you through the step by step way. On um, how did he win the humorous speech contest relating to how to craft his speech the, for the final contest, uh, how to add humor, and how to deliver the speech within that day. So just keep tuned. And we are looking forward to helping you to see you in the future workshops. That's really good, Gavin. Declan is an amazing speaker. He's an awesome speaker. I, I think I, I have known Declan from the time he joined Toastmasters. So it would be really fun to actually uh, attend his workshop and see how he came up with this speech. Yeah. Everyone, please uh, attend that also. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.